Hello everyone, I'm King Chan. If I haven't spoken to you yet, I'll probably get around uh, to meeting you out there on the floor if you have a table. I'm the writer creator of Zombie Overkill Death Squad and co-founder of Comics Underground Distribution, an independent comic book creators catalog that we're seeking to send out to 2,500 comic book shops or more and keep people on continuing to probe indie comics. Uh, presentation here is Mind Your Business to hit the brief history of comic book distribution. Now our story begins before the 1970s. A lot of comic books were found on local newsstands, grocery stores, local retailers, toy stores, even candy stores. And uh, comic books were more of a mad magazine type, uh, let's, you know, let's read some short little comic strips, nothing really major like what we had going on today. But from there, the direct market concept started to come out when Phil Swing, owner of Seagate Distribution, presented the idea to comic book publishers and said, hey, right now the current industry has a bunch of independent distributors where like there's hundreds of them all across the country. Basically, they're buying their product from a mid-level warehouse that's purchasing comic books from Marvel and DC and everywhere else at wholesale value. So as they're purchasing their comics, the prices are unstable. They're all over, all over the place. So Phil Swing, he comes in with this direct market approach. And he tells them, okay, let's bypass all these independent distributors. He tells Marvel, he tells DC, I can get your comics to the retailers directly. That way everybody gets more profit and we eliminate all these small mom and pop warehouse distributors. And then a key thing with the direct market strategy was that it got rid of returnable comics. Because the newsstand comics were much like newspapers and magazines. There's a 30 day returnability to them. So you couldn't order large quantities of a particular magazine or comic book because the distributor's taking all the risk, the publisher's taking extra risk. So depending on what your area is for sales, they're going to send you 10 copies, 20 copies, things such as that. Before the comic book specialty shops that started springing up in the early 70s, now, they can, now you can order as much as you want and they'll love it. But the only thing is the catch is you have to house those comics in your store and keep them on your inventory until you sell them, if you sell them. From there we go to uh, the early 80s where a lot of the publishers started creating more material because they're starting to see the readership change. Readership is turning more into a mature audience that wants to follow a story month to month. They want to follow a hero, they want to follow a character. So Marvel and DC really start focusing on characters and building brand awareness for these individual heroes and these individual series. And then we get Steve Jeppe. He comes in in 1982 and he buys Budco distributors. He buys all their warehouses and soon incorporates Diamond Comics distributors. Uh, in the early 80s, the, the, the rising trend of comic book specialty shops higher sales, it led to close to 20 major distributors all competing with each other. Highly competitive environment. They even made a trade organization for anybody that bought comics from Marvel or DC and distributed them to comic book shops. In 1988, Steve Jeffy Steve was uh, uh, nominated as being uh, the vice president of that trade organization. Uh, in the early 90s, the direct market was the primary market for DC Comics, Marvel Comics, collecting really started to grow. There, there was collectors everywhere. That mature audience, they were, they were all into it. This is the height of all these comic book stories. I remember being a kid and going into the comic book shop, going down the main street, and there was three comic book shops on one street, all competing with each other. Just the height. I remember. Batman issue 500, Bane breaks his back, I remember the death of Superman. This is like everyone's loving comics, everybody's seeing all these new stories go on, these characters that they've been following for so long. 
And then Diamond and Capital City dis Distribution, they basically started buying up everyone else. Bullying other people out of the market. These other distributors are going out of business. They're buying up their warehouses and becoming basically two primary distributors in the United States. They, they, they reached a height where they both had about 20 warehouses each throughout the United States. And then we get to the mid-90s where the direct market strategy of focusing primarily on mature readers and not expanding the audience. The direct market, where the newsstands, basically the comic book stores were for everybody. You didn't know who was going to read it, you just knew that they were selling it. For the comic book specialty shops, the specialty part was because it was only for certain readers. It was for those die-hard, dedicated fans that just, they were in there, they were in there always getting these new comics, following the same characters over and over again, that they neglected all the young readers, all the new customers that they could potentially bring in with these new stories. So we started to see the downfall of a lot of comic book stores, where the hype was over 8,000 comic book stores were, were operational in the, in the, uh, the mid-90s. Today, I think last number in 2000, in the early 2000s, was about 2,500 comic book stores remaining from that 8,000. So it's dropped drastically. And these major publishers, similar to the other brands that you see, their primary concern is let's protect our brand. Let's maintain our brand awareness. We don't want to put a bunch of money into new comic stories to reach new readers. We just want to keep the readers that we currently have. But that's just cannibalistic, and the entire business is collapsing and crumbling because of it. Even go to the point where Capital City announced uh, to publishers that if you do not meet your deadlines, we are going to penalize you for, for late shipments. And that right there turned to another series of I think were just totally unpredictable events that occurred after that. Because then we got the industry pushed for a 30-day returnability. Everybody was like, all right, we want some kind of returnability on these comics. It didn't work, because comics are still not returnable right now. And the then we had Marvel Comics. They made a decision in 1995 and said, okay, we don't need any of you distributors. We are basically 40% of the market ourselves. So we're just gonna go and buy our own distribution. So Marvel Comics goes and buys Heroes World and stops carrying everybody else's comic books. All the other publishers, you, you go worry about yourself. We're gonna distribute our own comics through Heroes World, which was a total utter failure, because Heroes World was not designed, was not capable of reaching out and delivering the huge demand that Marvel Comics had for their weekly shipments. They just they weren't able to do it. So we got Diamond, we got Capital City, and a few other major distributors that are still in operation. They're all, they're everybody's panicking. Because they just seen their business drop 35 to 40 percent, and they still have the same overhead cost. So everybody is in a panic. And now DC Comics, Image, Dark Horse, they're in a panic as well because they just lost shipments going through Heroes World. So Capital City and Diamond rushed quickly, competing with each other to grab all the remaining publishers and get exclusive exclusive contracts with them. Diamond won. Capital City failed, they lost. And they went out of business almost immediately after. And Diamond went out there and bought up the key warehouses that they wanted, filling their empire. So right now, <laughs> right now we, we live in a diamond controlled empire because of this chain of events that was the direct market. And Heroes World went out of business two years after it started.
So from 95 to 97. And as soon as they, as soon as they shut down in 97, Marvel went to Diamond and signed an exclusive contract as well. So that just closed the entire business. And still, no, none of them are interested in finding new readers. And this is like, this is, this is insane. Especially when you go to conventions like space and you see all the raw talent, you see all that passion in these indie comics that would sell if they had an opportunity to be to have shelf space in these comic book stores. But you have to be you know, part of the catalog. You have to be in a catalog to get in front of the comic book stores that are remaining. So these passionate comic book collectors and store owners can give you a shelf and put you on their shelves. But Diamond, the way they have their system structured, is they're going to present to you an opportunity to have your comic in their catalog, but it's really a dead end. Their cost, the expected sales that they demand that you have every month, or they'll drop you, or they'll penalize you somehow, it's just way too high. It's not realistic at all. So the, the whole business is still cannibalizing itself because they're trying to protect these key brands that Marvel and DC and the other top publishers have. Now, myself, with the independent comic book that we created, you know, we didn't know all of this. We didn't know anything about this. We just, we were being creative. We are being writers. We came out, went to a couple indie shows, found a couple artists, commissioned an artist to, to illustrate our graphic novel for us, and then when we, you know, you go to shows, you can only reach so many of your readers. You want more. You want to, you want to, because we want to write a series. You want to write a series. You want to tell the story that you have brewing inside you, that raw passion that you have as a writer, as a creator, that you want to share it with the world. It doesn't matter how much it costs you, because it's your passion. You want to release that to the world. And for companies like the top publishers and the sole distributor of comic books, for them to not take advantage of that, that's insane. They're missing out on huge opportunities here to bring in new readers. Because that's what we do. That's what indie comics does. The mainstream comics, they can't bring in new readership. They can't bring in a new audience. That's left to the independent comic book creators. That's why we're putting together Comics Underground Distribution the catalog. Because we're going to make this work. Now, we have our first comic convention scheduled for July 31st in Columbus, the same day as the Wizard World convention. We're going to be located directly across the street in the Greek Orthodox Cathedral. We already reserved the gymnasium. We are being highly strategic and highly aggressive for promoting independent comic books. And anyone who's interested in, in, in joining and reserving the table, send me an email, find me on Facebook, other social media, the website's currently under construction. Once it's completed, you'll start, to, you'll start to see some of the creators that we already have. They're going to be a part of our catalog. Right now we have 15 clients, and that number keeps on growing every day. Every day we're hearing from more and more indie creators that understand what we're doing here. That you, in order to sell comic books, you have to be on the shelves of comic book stores. Or, if not comic book stores, other stores, other shelves. But you have to have your product on the shelf to reach more and more customers, more and more of your readership. And we're going to continue to come up with other kinds of strategies. Uh, we're going to begin to start hosting local meetings with indie creators so we can get together and brainstorm. How can we make indie comics popular? How, how can we promote each other and ourselves? We want to start creating indie trivia games. We're going to, we're going to start up a indie comic book club where every week we throw out somebody else's comic book. And we tell, hey, everybody, let's go. Let's, let's start buying this comic this week. Let's get together. Let's talk about it. Let's share some notes. Let's have some drinks. I think it's possible. I think there's a future for independent comic books. I think independent comic books is the future of all comic books. I think indie comics is going to save the industry before it totally collapses. That's my presentation. Thank you for your time. And good luck out there.
Uh, you guys have any questions? Do you have uh, any kind of set catalog list of comic stores? Because I think a direct mail campaign to uh, your uh, Columbus, right? Uh, yeah, Columbus, Mansfield, yep. you get around. All I think like, it, would, it would cost a bit, but a direct <coughs> mail campaign to Midwestern comic shops would be a really good thing if each store you could find would get notice about that. I'm sure a lot of stores would want the catalog. Yeah. At least look at an opportunity to get some new stuff and get away from the diamond monopoly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. How much would you sell your catalog for? The catalog is going to be free. We're going to mail it out unsolicited to every comic book store that's still in operation. Yeah. Uh, we have a master list, and uh, there's a master list actually located online, and then the there's also diamonds. Is, yeah. List. yeah. The master list is a bunch of them are not in operation. Yeah. But then there's diamonds store locator on their website. We can use that as well to find a bunch of comic shops. Yeah. We actually have already called probably 60 to 70 percent of comic book shops and verified which ones are open and who's interested in, in comic books and carrying indie comics specifically. And there is a great deal of them. Yeah. There are some comic shops that have exclusive contracts with Diamond and can't carry other people's stuff. But there's a lot of indie comic book shops out there. I was just wondering, uh, kind of riffing off the same question, would you? Uh, is there a way to suggest stores that are not comic book shops? Because there's a couple that I work with um, that are, there's like a record store is one of them. So could, um, in my email, uh, when I contact you, could I just put that in there and say, no, would you be interested in this too? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. We're, we're just, we're setting the foundation with the established comic book shops, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to reach out everywhere we can. Anywhere we think we can cross the cross the markets to find new readers, we're gonna try it out. We we uh we we don't take no <laughs> as like the final answer. You know, everything's a negotiation. Everything is an obstacle. When I got a rejection letter for my comic book going out to Diamond, all it was was an obstacle. That's it. We're, going to, we're constantly seeking opportunities from obstacles. And that's what, this, that's what our catalog represents, is a huge opportunity for all independent comic book creators. And I'm a huge pain in the ass, and I'm not going to stop. Any other questions? Well, if you guys have any, uh, any further questions later on, you know, something comes to mind, shoot me an email, send me a text or something. Be cool. I'll be more than uh, glad to answer them. Thanks for coming, guys. All right, thank you.